Hey everyone, welcome to week two. If you're going to get comfortable, grab a snack. We're going to get started in about five minutes or so. <laughs> hey everyone, Mr. Borch, Joshua, Dimitri. It's very exciting. I've never had mods before. So. Yeah, use your power wisely, please. Hey, Daisy Stomper. Hey, I see Nils. Hello, Jarvis. Cool. Thanks, Jarvis. There will be another problem set this week. I am still in the process of writing it, but uh, I will link the next assignment. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the uh, video description for this video as well. Hey, Caleb. Hey, Luis, Orlando, welcome. All right, Luis, I saw your question in the chat last week about the uh, Super Collider book and how it was like possibly out of date. I, th I think it's still a pretty good book. It is a little, I mean, I think it's 2015 or so. I'm actually going to share some resources, some, uh, some other textbooks today. Um, anyway, hey, everybody, welcome. It's 3 o'clock. Um, this is week two of Coding with Super Collider. So today... Uh, I would like to get into the basics of 
uh, uh, using the audio server and understanding what unit generators are and the very basics of making sound. I think last week I said we were going to maybe scratch the surface with uh, iteration, which is a useful and powerful topic, but I think I'm going to put that off for a later week and just kind of focus on sound today. So <clears throat> first thing I want to do is uh, make you all aware of a resource online, which is Bruno Ruviaro's gentle introduction to Super Collider. So I will put a link in the video description when this is archived. And I think it's also linked in the video description for my tutorial zero video. Um, so this was written in 2014, revised 2015. And it's just a really excellent um, textbook. Uh, so I would definitely recommend uh, for week two, reading through section Roman numeral one basics, which will cover a lot of the stuff that we covered last week, just kind of refresh your memory on that. There's a little uh, subsection two on server and language and booting the server. And then also worth taking a peek um, for now is section Roman numeral four, sound synthesis and processing. And so these, uh, these sections here, this is kind of sort of what we're going to get into this week. So definitely check this out. It's a great supplement to a course like this. So keep it in mind. Okay, so let's get into some super collider stuff. Uh, let me start by talking a little bit about the architecture of the program. So super collider gives the impression of being one unified program, but it's actually uh, multiple programs uh, that sort of exist or coexist as one. And in particular, there is um, something called the uh, the language or the client. Uh, the actual name of the application is called SC Lang. And that is the program that uh, contains the interpreter, which is the uh, program that parses and evaluates your code and makes sense of it and just turns this from a basic text editor into a programming language. So that's called language side or client side. And the application again is sclang. And then uh, there's also the uh, audio server, uh, which uh, the application name is called sc-synth, sometimes just called the server. And this is the part of Super Collider that is exclusively responsible for uh, processing audio signals, for generating, processing, and otherwise calculating and dealing with audio signals. And these two programs, SCLang and SCSynth, are completely decoupled. Um, it's possible to run one without the other. And it makes for some very interesting possibilities, for example, in like a laptop ensemble or some other real-time collaborative thing, you can have multiple people running the Super Collider client on their own computer, and then there could be one computer which is running the server, and uh, you have this sort of centralized hub of synthesis and processing, and there's just lots of uh, really good uh, flexibility options there. Um, so that's that's sort of what makes Super Collider kind of unique. Now, <clears throat> when you first start up Super Collider, you know, open up the icon and it pops up and you see the development interface here, uh, in the bottom right, you'll see the status bar, and you can see interpreter is active and in green. That means the language side application is running, and so we can you know type code and evaluate code and get results in the post window. And the other numbers are white; they're all zero, and it says server. So this means the server side of Super Collider is not active; it's um it's off. And so if you want to do anything related to sound in Super Collider, the first thing you need to do is boot the audio server. And there are multiple ways to do this. I think the quickest and fastest way, maybe with the exception of a keyboard shortcut, is to type s.boot and uh, shift return to run that. And as you do that, the post window will give you a whole bunch of information. Let's actually detach this for a moment. And you'll also see the numbers in the bottom right turn green. And so what we have here is uh, we say booting server, local host. Uh, it gives you a list of all of the available sound devices. I've got a, a whole ton of them. It also tells you uh, which hardware devices, hardware audio devices Super Collider is using for input and output. So I've got my Motu interface which is what my microphone is connected to. And uh, Loopback Audio is a software driver which allows me to pipe audio 
from Super Collider into OBS so I can stream it. So yours is going to look a little bit different, but um, you should should boot up nicely with s.boot. And um, it also tells you the sample rate. So quick bit about sample right here. Kind of assuming people know a little bit about digital audio at this point, but any digital audio system runs at a sampling rate, which is the number of audio samples that are processed per second. And I'm running at 48,000. I tend to run on 44.1, but now that everything's online and everyone's on Zoom, the Zoom audio driver is locked at 48. So I've just kind of adapted my setup to live on 48,000. So this will come up from time to time, but it's just important to remember that digital audio is represented as numbers, floating point numbers, specifically 48,000 of them per second. And those numbers represent the shape of a waveform that's then converted to an analog signal and played out of your loudspeakers or headphones and turned into a sound wave. And this is what you want to see, Super Collider 3 server ready. And we've booted the server. So let's dock this. And let's go ahead and clear the post window. And I just want to quickly show you uh, how you can turn off the server. You can just type s.quit. And you can just sort of boot and quit all day long. Turn it on, turn it off. When it's on, it's ready to make sound, and when you quit it, it's done. A couple other ways, you can go to the server menu, and there's a boot server option here, which will change to quit after you quit. By convention, the lowercase letter s, the interpreter variable, which is a, acts as a global variable, s is reserved for the instance of the local server running on your computer. Um, so you can overwrite s, but it's generally not in your best interest to do so. so all the other ones, a, b, etc., these are all just nothing, but S contains a reference to the local audio server. So the longer way of doing this is server.local.boot. Local is a class method for the class server, which returns the local instance of the server. And then we tell that instance, boot yourself. So it's just another way of doing the same thing, boot and quit. And um, yet another way, you can type uh, s.make window. And this is kind of like uh, something, there's, back in older versions of Super Collider, this window was always uh, visible. And it's just a little representation of the server, so you can click the little boot button. It'll boot up. Uh, you also have this handy volume knob, and this M is a mute button. You can also click record, and anything that plays onto the sort of lowest hardware outputs, basically your headphones or speakers, will get recorded to a file, which is pretty handy. So you can just very easily capture any sound Super Collider makes. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's close this. We don't really need that. The server is booted. I want to share with you some other uh, useful tools uh, related to the server. So the first one is uh, meter indicators, which you can bring up with s.meter. And this brings up a little meter window. And the two meters on the left represent your inputs, so you can see my voice coming in in real time. And the two on the right represent your outputs. Right now, we're not playing any audio, so we don't see anything. And by default, Super Collider assumes you have two hardware output channels, so a left and a right speaker, and two hardware input channels. Right now, I'm only using one, you know, but um, you can change this number if you want, but unless you're doing something fairly exotic, two in and two out for hardware is um, is pretty, is, is fine. So uh, the main point of the meters is uh, your ears can sometimes play tricks on you. And it's really important when you're working with digital audio to keep your levels within range. And it's it's a programming language, so there's nothing stopping you from saying amplitude a million. And wham, you'll just like clock out those meters and they will be solidly red and you'll probably hurt your ears and become very sad. Uh, so as you work, it's don't, don't just trust what you hear, but actually watch the meters and, and make sure that nothing is sort of all the way up at the top in the red because then you'll have a clipped audio signal, you'll get distortion, and it's just stuff we want to avoid. So another tool, s.scope. This is a waveform scope, which allows us to view the um, waveforms. Uh, by default, it's showing us the two output channels. Uh, so basically output bus 0 and 1, because SuperCollider starts counting at 0. And um, so that's kind of handy. It's just a different way of viewing the waveform. Freakscope.new gives us a frequency analyzer. So we can actually see the spectrum. This is always monophonic, and you can. it's currently set to bus 0, which is the left channel. You can change that to 1 if you want to view the other channel. 
And I think one more tool I want to bring up is uh, this is uh, the the node tree. And I don't want to get too in depth here, but basically this is a visualization of all of the processes that are currently running on SC Synth. Um, so the gray box here is the default group. That's where most synthesis processes, you know, just any any sort of signal generator things we come up with will go. And the white boxes on the outside are a consequence of loading all these widgets. So um, I think the the node tree is not going to be immediately useful, but you might want to keep it open anyway, just in case. And Eric, to answer your question, uh, I think if you're just starting out with SuperCollider, I wouldn't bother with the uh, startup file. That's uh, is not too many cases where you really need to go messing around with the startup file, but it can be useful. Um, okay, hey, let's make some sound. So the quickest and easiest way to make sound in Super Collider is to play a function. And if you'll remember from last week, functions are delineated with curly braces. And then inside the function, what you want to do is fill uh, the function with one or more uh, what are called unit generators, or UGENs for short. So a UGEN is a class uh, of objects that deals with audio signals. It might generate an audio signal. It might process an audio signal. <coughs> some of them just uh, are you know, oscillators, noise generators. Uh, some of them play a f an audio file from your hard drive. Some of them are filters. The best way to think about UGENs is like, imagine having a sort of gigantic analog modular synthesizer where you've got oscillators and filters and every and uh super collider is kind of like a, a an infinitely large one where you can have any kind and any number and they're like little building blocks for signal chains where you can say i want three oscillators i want to send them into a filter and i want to add some noise and i want to play these files back and play them backwards so you gents do all this sorts of stuff and uh i'm going to uh, bring this up now. I was going to bring this up at the end, but I did prepare uh, sort of uh, Eli's patented uh, list of essential UGENs. And this is a very subjective list, but if you want, you can grab a screenshot of this. Uh, the homework this week will sort of encourage you to poke around with some of these options, but all of the names in blue are unit generators. And I've kind of grouped them with the oscillators at the top. Uh, and then we have noise generators, filters, triggers, which are useful for like starting and resetting certain other types of UGENs, like envelopes, which is the next category here, uh, unit generators that play an audio file. We have some uh, delays, so you can get echo effects, and then some unit generators that do like mono stereo panning. Um, so yeah, we'll come back to this at the end, uh, but um, just to give you a taste of the kinds of unit generators that are out there. So let's make one. Let's, let's just use the one of the simplest ones I can think of and play a tone. So sign OSC, remember you can click on any class or method and command D to bring up the help file, is a unit generator that produces a sine wave. And actually if we go back a second to the UGEN page, uh, you remember that uh, certain methods, like uh, I think we saw POW last time, uh, certain methods like POW, uh, they need uh, um, uh, an argument. Actually, I, uh, I'm getting two concepts confused here. Let me back up a step. Uh, uh, we, we remember the receiver method paradigm, where we have some object and we need to pass it a method. So SINOSC is uh, the class uh, of objects called SINOSC. So it doesn't it's not an actual sign generator itself. In order to create an instance of the SINOSC class, we need to send it one of these three methods, AR, KR, IR, AR stands for audio rate, KR is control rate, IR is initialization rate. Now the short story here is if you want to listen to a unit generator, you know, monitor, play it through your uh, loudspeakers, it has to be running at the audio rate. Um, so we put dot AR here. Now, don't run this yet. I know it's tempting, but don't, if you're following along, don't run this just quite yet. Um, KR is control rate. It's good for uh, low frequency signals that control other unit generators, like a, like a, a slow-moving envelope shape. And then IR, it just happens once. It, it calculates exactly one value. But AR is the sort of high-resolution version of all of these waveforms. It's, um, it's going to produce 48,000, at least in my case, 48,000 samples uh, 
per second. And those samples are going to be, each one of them is going to be a floating point number. And if we were to graph them, they would make the shape of a sine wave. Now, before I run this, there's two things I want to do, one of which is to turn the volume down a little bit. So you can just click on the, um, the server numbers here and just turn that volume down because the default output of most generators is nominal. It's full amplitude, and a full amplitude sine wave is loud. So I'm going to turn that down a little bit. And the other thing is there's no envelope here. There's no duration. There's no sense of something being finite. A sine wave is just a generator. It's like we're going to flick a switch, and it's on. And it's on, and it's on, and it's on. It's going to play forever. So it's really important to know how to stop sound. And the absolute fastest and best way to stop sound is the uh, keyboard shortcut command period, which is control period on Windows and Linux. Don't even bother with the menu here. Just memorize this keyboard shortcut command period. It will save your butt um, again and again and again. So um, let's go ahead and do it. Just put your cursor on this line, shift, return. And you can see we've got level meter on the outputs. We've got a sine wave on the scope here. We can adjust it sort of horizontally and vertically if we want. It's purely visual. And our frequency analyzer gives us a single sort of infinitely small band right here. And we can also see we've made a little synthesis process. And then let's go ahead and hit command period. And it goes away. So, congratulations, you've just made your first sine wave. It's very exciting. Uh, so, yeah, so this is a function.play. This is a convenient construction that's basically a little syntax shortcut uh, that gives you a very quick way to mess around with unit generators. So you can just, you know, put any ugen you like in there and play it. Just be really careful with your volume. I think it's, um, from one perspective, it's good to work with the volume kind of uh, low, but... Um, what I tend to prefer is working with uh, the volume sort of nominal and then having my uh, system volume, my operating system volume kind of low. Um, because when you turn the volume down here in Super Collider, it, uh, it brings these levels down. And if you sort of, if you've forgotten that you've turned the volume down, it's easy to trick yourself into thinking that your, um, your signals are nice and low. But then if you send your code to somebody else and they didn't turn their volume down, all of a sudden it's much louder. So. I like working at zero because what you see is what you get, but I'm turning it down here just for so that, you know, I don't spook you all with loud noises on stream. All right, so uh, let's move on, though. Uh, there are, you can easily imagine uh, a situation where we don't just have one sound. Maybe we have a sine wave and a noise generator and a sawtooth wave and a buffer playback eugen and they're all kind of playing together, and it's like this nice, harmonious, weird texture. If we press Command period, it stops all of them. And there, you can easily imagine a situation where we don't want to just kill everything. We want to sort of strategically, individually remove uh, synthesis processes from the server. And the way to do that is the free method, or that's, that's one way anyway. That's a, sort of the second fastest way to do it. But in order to free a synthesis process, we need to give it a name so that we can refer to it later on. Uh, so what we can do is just say, I don't know, um, sign equals sign play, And then later on, we'll say sign dot free. So run that line. I turned the volume up to zero, didn't I? I hope that wasn't uh, too loud for all of you. Uh, I think I've got it, got it down a little bit in OBS, but... Um, I should be more careful. Uh, let's bring it down to like minus six or something. Well, it's not so much that a function returns an object you can play, it's uh, functions respond to the play message. Um, and they respond to the play message by doing a bunch of fancy stuff under the hood, piping messages from language to server, and that results in the creation of a synthesis node on, on the server. So it, you basically got the right idea. It's just that functions respond to the play message by making sound on the server. So that's the free message, pretty handy. That way we can sort of make, uh, for example, if we had another unit generator, let's really bring this down here, uh, you know, something like this, and we'll say saw, saw.ar, and then we're, we don't want to call this sign because then as soon as we make that, we'll be overwriting this sign with this new function. Maybe I'll demonstrate that in just a second. So here we can say sign and saw, 
and then we will free the saw and free the sign. Uh, if if I accidentally gave this the same name and ran this line and then this line and then said sign.free, it would free the saw because that was the most recent thing that was named sign. And actually this, uh, the actual sign osc has been overwritten. So it's still playing on the server, but the language side global variable no longer points to that synthesis object. It points to the saw, which is free. So uh, whenever you use global variables, you really, it's really important to um, remember to name them carefully. And no, once you free a, a UGen, it's, uh, it's gone permanently. So uh, freeing is, is, a, is a permanent thing. If you want to, you, I think you can pause synths. So if we do this. Uh, I think it's paused equals true. Uh, no, I, I, I know there's a way to do this, but um, I'm getting it wrong. Uh, I bet you can dig through some of the help files to find that. But no, free, free should be considered a, a permanent action. Uh, okay, now, okay, you're probably all noticing that we're listening to monophonic sound. And if you're on headphones, it's only in the left ear, and I bet that is pretty obnoxious. So uh, let's talk a little bit about mono, stereo, multi-channel uh, sound. And before we do, let's just step out of server land for a second and come back to uh, the language, where, uh, if you remember, we have a type of object called array, which can contain, you know, basically any kind of information. It's an ordered collection of information. And how does this relate to the server and multi-channel audio? Well, uh, it does in the following way. Um, the server interprets arrays of UGENs, arrays containing UGENs, as a multi-channel signal. And so if it receives an array of UGENs, it will place the zeroth index item, item with index zero, on output zero, and it'll put the next one on output one. So uh, the one way we could do this is by providing an array of two sine waves, like this. And now you will see and hear a sine wave in both ears. Uh, now. I'm just going to hit command period to stop that. Uh, so that means you could do something else, like uh, pink noise. Pink noise generator, now you'll hear sign in the left, pink noise in the right. Now, if you simply want to take one monophonic signal and just copy it, it it's pretty um, you know, tedious to have to write it out a second time and surround them with square brackets. So there's a shortcut for this. Like, let's say we have the number 5, and we want to turn this into the array, 5, 5. We can do this with the method DUP, which is short for duplicate. And we provide the number of copies we want. So 5.dup2 gives us the array 5.5. Five. We could put whatever number we want here. This would give us an array of size 6 containing copies of the number 5. Um, so we can do this with uh, a sign -osc. We can just say, instead of doing all this business, let's use the dupe method. So that's less typing. And even faster is the syntax shortcut exclamation point. So 5 exclam 6 is the same thing as 5.dup6. And so we could just as easily say sinos.ar exclam2. So this exclam2, that is a thing you will probably see throughout uh, Bruno's textbook and lots of examples. It's just, um, it's the quickest and cheapest way to just take a mono signal and make it stereo. So keep that one in mind for sure. And before we move on from multi-channel stuff, I do want to very, very uh, superficially touch on the idea of multi-channel expansion and also get into <clears throat> the idea of arguments because you probably noticed that the sign -osc is exactly the same every time. Same pitch, same loudness. Uh, so let's go over to the help file for sign -osc. And uh, let's look at its arguments. Now here's 
Uh, so its, it's arguments are freak, phase, mull, and add. Uh, and so now this is why I originally brought up 5.pow4 because some methods like pow require uh, at least one argument to tell it what to do. If we get rid of this pow, if we get rid of the 4 and we just say 5.pow, this doesn't work because pow means to the power of. And so if we just say 5 to the power of awkward silence, it says, no, hey now, hey, I can't do that. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So you need to open up parentheses and give uh, methods the arguments they expect. Five to the power of four. Uh, now, uh, ugents kind of work the same way. Uh, we have, um, uh, in the case of sinosc, four expected arguments. Frequency in hertz, phase in radians, and then two more arguments called mull and add. Um, and as we start talking about these arguments, it's really important to remember that everything involved on the server, all of the ugen output, the numbers we feed into them, everything is just floating point numbers. Uh, so let's, if we crack open a set of parentheses here, there's a little convenient pop-up that gives us the expected arguments and their default values. So these values uh, are what Sinosk has been using in all of the previous cases when we didn't specify otherwise. So it's been playing a sine wave at 440 hertz with an initial phase of zero radians, a mull value of one, and an add value of zero. So let's, let's go through these one by one. So we can actually provide an alternate uh, number for some of them. Let's just say, let's only change frequency. So now we have 300 hertz, 500 hertz. Turn this up a little bit. A little more quiet than I want it to be. Uh, 800 hertz. And we can go all the way down. Let's say 100 hertz. Now, if you're on headphones, you might be able to hear this. Laptop speakers, probably not. 50, 40, 30. If we go all the way down, we're not going to hear anything anymore. It's just going to be a wiggly, slow-moving thing, right? 3 hertz sine wave. And I, I will spare you from the torture of high frequencies. I will let you... Uh, torture yourself. Oh, glad someone's got a subwoofer out there. That's cool. Okay. Yes, I'm happy to rumble anyone's subwoofer anytime. So that's frequency. Uh, phase, uh, we actually will not hear much of a difference if we change phase. If we're just listening to a sine wave, the initial phase offset is not really going to affect our perception. So I'd like to use this opportunity to introduce another useful server-related method, which is plot followed by an argument representing the amount of time, the amount of time's worth of signal you want to plot. So let's just say uh, two, uh, sorry, 20 milliseconds or 0 0.02 seconds. And cool, look at that. We have a sine wave. So this is the first 0 0.02 seconds of this, the output of this unit generator function. And it's, uh, so basically one full cycle occurs 300 times a second. And the initial phase is zero, which means the sine wave starts at its, um, uh, at zero in an upward trajectory. So if we change this to uh, pi, which is half of one cycle, now it starts halfway through that cycle and going in a downward trajectory. So we could also do uh, pi over 2, which is a quarter of a cycle. So it starts one quarter of the way through a cycle. Right? So here's sort of zero radians. Uh, right here at the top is pi over 2, pi radians, 3 pi over 2, and then one full cycle is 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi. So I'll play a couple of these. Let's just play a couple of these in different... So we'll do 3 pi over 2. Here's... um. And we should uh, play these. Right, so it don't sound any different. It's just 300 cycles per second. The initial phase is not going to matter. But in other cases, which we'll sort of get into later, uh, the initial phase does actually have quite a quite a bit of uh, impact. Okay, let's talk about mull for a second. So let's reset this to zero. Now, mull 
is a value that is an argument that you see in lots of unit generators, not just sine OSC, but basically any unit generator has a mull, and it represents a value that is multiplied by every single sample value in the unit generator. So normally sine OSC is nominal, basically it's full full amplitude as we can, uh, if we had this set to zero decibels, we would see it completely fill out this, uh, make the stereo again, just for, ah, it's so much nicer. And uh, it would be full amplitude. So let's make this um, 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.25. 25 point, I don't know, 0.5, right? So it gets quieter. So super collider, basically mull in this case is just scaling the amplitude of the signal. So one is full amplitude. So let's actually, you know, bring this, bring this back up to zero and we'll set the mull to be something like, you know, 0.3, right? It is possible to modulate the phase. Check out the um, examples in the SINOSC help file. There is a phase modulation example. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but yeah, check that out for sure. Uh, and then I do want to briefly talk about add, which is, uh, let's, so we'll set the amplitude to 5.5. And I'm going to change the add value uh, incrementally. So let's make it, we'll just add 0.1, 0.2, or three. So watch the waveform on the scope in the upper left. So add, as you would expect, is just a value to be added to each sample in the waveform. This is a weird thing to do if you're listening to uh, if you're listening to this waveform. It's generally not the kind of thing you want to send to your speakers for long periods of time. Because add equates to something called DC bias or DC offset, which is a shifting of the waveform away from its sort of equilibrium. Um, useful in some situations, but not when you're sending it straight to loudspeakers. Um, so uh, anyway, I hope this gives you a, a general sense of the arguments. As far as syntax goes, you don't always have to specify all of the arguments. For example, we already saw that if we just don't specify anything, it uh, is going to give us a full amplitude sine wave, right? So let's say we only want to specify frequency and mull. We want to skip over phase. We can say, okay, let's do, uh, you know, eh, 500 hertz. And then instead of slogging our way through a list of arguments, we can just say mull colon and then whatever value we want. Um, it wouldn't hurt to do something like this, although it's not necessary. We could say, you know, freak mall. But when we do specify arguments explicitly, it does allow us to change the order. So this is fine, right? But if we don't explicitly specify the argument names, then SuperCollider has no way to tell which one, you know, we. it's just going to take the first one and say, okay, frequency 0.2, phase 500. And this is going to be pretty weird. Uh, yeah, it is a 0.2 hertz sine wave with an initial phase of, 500, which is getting like, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's no good. So um, you want to keep in mind the order of these arguments and be aware of which ones you're specifying. For example, you do not generally want to plug a frequency value in for a mull argument because mull expects values sort of usually, if you're sending it to speakers, between zero and one. And above one is like, you know, clipping. It's a, that's above the, uh, above zero dB. And if you say like, a thousand. Well, you're gonna be. You're gonna be sorry. You're gonna be wish. You're gonna wish you didn't do that. Um, okay. Uh, so let's let's get into some some of the sort of fun stuff here. Let's just make a little divider here. Uh, we don't just have to make a single unit generator. Here's an example of mixing. So we can say uh, we'll call this sum, and let's space it out on multiple lines. Now we can say, and let's even let's even make a variable, right? Because we're going to be doing something a little bit more complicated here. So sig equals sine os dot ar. Let's say uh, four hundred, um, and let's say mull point two. And now we're going to do some some sort of basic function building here. Let's say I want to play three sine waves together. Uh, you know, if, if this were on a mixer, you'd have three input channel strips and you just bring all three faders up. So how do we do that in Super Collider? 
Well, we just simply add them together. So let's make another sine wave, which is maybe uh, a little bit lower and a little bit louder. And let's play that. Right? And we could uh, keep going and say, let's give ourselves like a fairly quiet one that's uh, a little bit higher. And what we're basically doing here is additive synthesis. Um, so you can just, there's lots of different ways to do it. You can, um, you could declare three variables, call them sig1, sig2, sig3, and then uh, set them all uh, equal to what they're supposed to be equal to. Sort of like this. And at the bottom say sig1 plus sig2 plus sig3. And that should do it. Same idea. So there's more than one way to do it. There's, it's not a it's not sort of a rigid formula here. You just have to follow the syntactical rules. And you can add all sorts of uh, unit generators together and see what you get. You can experiment with like pulse waves, sawtooth waves, noise generators, etc. Uh, so that's the basic, that's how you mix, right? You add signals together, you hear them simultaneously. They simply sum and you hear them, they mix, they mix very nicely. But let's talk about the much more interesting concept here, which is um, modularity. So let's imagine a vibrato effect. And let me check my audio preferences here for just one second. Uh, I want output to be a loopback. Good. And here's a, a flute sample. Should be able to hear this. And I've artificially introduced a vibrato effect, a, a fairly subtle but sort of noticeable vibrato effect. And just in case you're not sure if you're hearing it, here's a really cartoonish version. Okay. What I want to do is try to create that in Super Collider. So uh, we won't do a flute sample. We'll just make a, a sine wave. And uh, let's say, let's call this uh, uh, Vib. And so this is sort of a, an interesting challenge here. Let's get rid of all this stuff. And well, let's think about this, right? So we want some sound source, a sine wave, and we want to apply a vibrato effect. Uh, so a vibrato effect is a slow frequency variation, a sort of oscillating variation in the frequency of some sound source so that the pitch appears to sort of wobble and you know do that sort of thing. So I think uh, in general when you're programming it's great to start by just making names for things. So let's make a variable called sig which is going to be the, the signal we actually send to our speakers and vib which is a, a signal or unit generator that's going to represent the, the motion of the vibrato. Uh, so we'll start by making our sine wave, and we'll just give it a give it a frequency to start with, and um, say mull uh, point two and exclamation point two to make it stereo. Now we could play this now, and we'd just get a three hundred hertz stereo uh, sine wave. But how do we introduce this vibrato? And we could sort of think about this. Uh, we have a fixed frequency of 300, and we sort of want this frequency to go like up a little bit, and then down a little bit, and then up a little bit, and down a little bit at a vibrato rate. You know, so first question is, okay, how fast is vibrato? Like how many cycles, wee, 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 you know, how many cycles per second is it? And Jarvis has the right idea. We oscillate the frequency. So the solution here is, um, or one possible solution is, is make another sine -osc. And I'm going to use AR here. Uh, in just a moment, I'll try to explain that it's not totally necessary, but uh, so that we're not explaining three things at once, we'll just make another sine wave. And now this, this is not a sine wave we're going to listen to. It's going to be a sine wave that represents a sinusoidal fluctuation in frequency. Right, we could use KR uh, because this is controlling an aspect of another unit generator, and it would save us a little bit of CPU power. Um, but we're going to do AR for now. So vibrato is, I don't know, six, seven hertz. Uh, 
And and then we need to say, okay, what's if we just leave this as is and like plug this in here, remember the default output of SINOSC in terms of a numerical range is negative one to positive one, which means the values of VIB at any point in time, it's going to be somewhere between negative one and positive one. And if we plug those values into the frequency here, we're not going to hear anything. It's going to be a, a tone that just sort of flubs around between minus one and positive one hertz. It's just, just not working. So we need to uh, cook these values a little bit. Um, so we'll skip over phase um, and we'll just say, um, uh, you know, maybe the right question is, what are appropriate values here? We started at 300, so maybe we could try, you know, sort of going between uh, 320 and 280 or something like that. So this is kind of the um, annoying way to do it, but we need to think, okay, 280 to 320, that's a range of 40, right? Uh, so we can scale this sine OSC by uh, 40. So it's going to initially range from minus 40 to positive 40, because that's the mull value. Mull scales the output of the, uh, the unit generator. And then we need to shift this by um, 300, right? So we take that minus 40 to positive 40 range, and we add 300 to every single value. So actually, this is that would take us to, ah, so now the range is actually going to be, let's see, negative 40 plus 300 is 260, and the upper end is going to be 340. So that's bigger than we expected. The, I think we should have done this, we should have done 20, so that it's minus 20 to positive 20, and then we shift it up. So if we do this now, that's, that's more what we expected. If it was 40, it's a little bit, the, the sort of, uh, range of the vibrato is even more. We could make this 100. Right? Now we get this, this sort of crazy vibrato. And if we increase the frequency, we're not really in vibrato territory anymore. Now we're doing, you know, frequency modulation. I mean, it's pretty cool, but it's not a vibrato effect anymore. So something like this is a sort of nice vibrato effect. And I did it this way first because it's really annoying to have to think about numbers this way. Like you want the output range to be 280 to 320, but somehow you have to do the math in your head. So don't bother with any of that. Just uh, here is alternatively, instead of even touching mull and add, just provide the frequency. And then you can use uh, range, dot range at the end of a unit generator to... Uh, map its range to specific values. So this this gives you a sine OSC at 6 hertz, and the numerical range of that unit generator's output is going to be minus 280 to positive 320. And we are using that signal as the frequency of another sine OSC. And remember that functions always return the last item, which is sig. So, you know. That's very nice. Uh, and just to, just to demonstrate, if we were to go down here and say zero, right? functions return their last, their last uh, item. So this is playing the number zero as a signal. So it's ze every sample is zero. <laughs> so it's nothing. Uh, so we basically muted the entire thing. So we'll hit command period, do it again. Okay, so from here, I hope you could, uh, you could maybe figure out how to do, say, a tremolo effect or um, maybe like a police siren or, or other things like that. Uh, let's see, let's, do, let's just do one more uh, cute example here. And let's start with um, a pulse wave and um, just say SIG is, SIG is some pulse wave uh, at um, 200 hertz. Now, pulse waves have a, a width, which um, we'll keep that at 0.5. This is sort of the ratio of how much of the wave is up and how much of the wave is down. So 0.5 means a square wave. So it's up exactly the same amount of time that it's down as it oscillates. Um, 
and we'll set the amplitude to be 0.2. Stereo, if I that, play it now, we just get a pulse wave. It's not too loud. Turn that down a little bit. So yeah, got a nice pulse wave. And what I'd like to do is use a low frequency saw to just kind of make the frequency go boop, boop, boop. You know, just for fun. So let's just say one hertz. And we'll set the range to be, um, we're going to say zero to 500. And we're going to add that unit generator to 200. So before we run this, take a step back. We've got a unit generator called MOD, which is a low frequency sawtooth wave. So it's just a pure ramp shape, one cycle per second. The first argument of LF saw is the frequency. And then we're saying its range is going to be from zero to 500. And we're adding that to the frequency of this pulse wave. So this pulse wave's frequency will range from 200 to 700. So it'll sound like this. Yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> um, okay. Now, um, so that's range. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think we're making pretty good time here. I don't want to get too deep into other things. I guess there's one one little quick tip I can show you. So we've been doing a lot of uh, sort of this, uh, using mull to specify amplitude. And all mull is doing is scaling every sample of the sine wave by 0.2. And I just wanted to point out that there's another very valid way of doing this, and that is simply multiplying the, the unit generator by, uh, by 0.2. Because signals are just numbers. Um, so it's, um, you know, we could, if we did something like, uh, you know, normally multiplication is just have like some number times some number equals some number. Here we have some number times an infinite sequence of numbers, which are floats and which uh, form the shape of a sine wave. So this point two gets multiplied by every single sample in the same in the in the sine wave. It's ex the exact same uh, operation as providing point two for mul. So this also gives us um, right amplitude. Very nice. If we wanted to do kind of a multi-line approach. Uh, Say var sig equals sine osc, var sig equals sig times 0.1, and then finally sig equals sig. And this is kind of like a very verbose, but also extremely readable version where we have a sig, which is a sine wave at 400 hertz. We scale the amplitude, we copy it to the second channel, and there we go. Oh, there is one more thing. Uh, I think earlier I was talking about uh, arrays. Right, and so how we use this exclamation point to make it stereo. And I wanted to hint at a concept called multi-channel expansion. And this, is a, this takes a little bit of brain twisting to really internalize it. If we get rid of that exclamation point too, it's mono, right? And so we know if we uh, make, make the signal stereo with exclamation point, we get two. But you can actually uh, specify uh, an array for the argument of a unit generator. So for example, here, make this a little bit louder, uh, the frequency of this sine osc is the array 300, 400. Now, what does that mean? Now, how can a sine wave have two frequencies, right? Well, what happens here is that the array for that argument uh, expands outward. And so what this becomes, uh, or how Super Collider, how the, how the server sees this is the array sine osc AR 300, sine osc AR 400. So it's a 300 hertz tone in the left, a 400 hertz tone in the right, and what we get is this.
And so you can multi-channel expand uh, any Ugen in this way. It's not quite binaural beats because the frequencies are too uh, far apart, but if we did something like this, then we'd get binaural beating, which is a lovely effect. I really, I really enjoy binaural beats. Right? And then we could say, you know, let's just let that run for a while. And let's make another one called Y. And we'll say 400 and 402.5. Maybe one more. Uh, let's do 250 and 250.5. And we'll call this Z. Always watch the level meters, right? Make sure they're not uh, creeping up too high. Of course, we are down by 5.7 decibels right now. Anyway, and then we can say x dot free, y dot free, and z dot free. All right. Uh, free is definitely not an elegant way to stop sound, but uh, in the next week, possibly the week after that, we'll really get into sort of a larger collection of unit generators and how we can apply envelopes and fade things out and blend things really nicely, get into more textures, oscillators, filters, noise generators. But um, I think I'm going to stop it here uh, for today. So I, I hope this has been uh, illuminating in some ways, just kind of getting a sense of turning on the server, plugging some unit generators together, putting them in a function, playing it, giving it a name. And then um, there's there's a lot more where this came from, but I think this is a good place to, to stop for the week. All right, so uh, thanks everybody for watching. I uh, don't forget about uh, Bruno, Bruno Rubiaro's tutorial, very handy resource. And uh, definitely check that out. And keep an eye on the video description for when this live stream gets archived. And I'll put another homework assignment for anyone who wants to sort of follow along with the class. Right. Yeah, happy to do it. Thanks everybody for watching and hanging out. I really appreciate the support. And oh, you know, what? here's just one more thing. Here's my. Uh, essential collection of eugens just so we can end on this page um, just in case anyone wants to keep in mind this is definitely not an exhaustive list but it's a good place to start i think if you were to look at all of my super collider compositions over the past five years most of the eugens would be included on this list all right uh that's it for me let's quit the old server and i will see everybody next week enjoy Happy coding, and see you then.